Thank you. Well, welcome everyone, uh, both in the room and online. I see we've got quite a few people uh, online. Uh, I want to welcome Jose Marengo, uh, very old friend of mine from Brazil. We've been known for nearly 25 years now, haven't we? So, so Jose is a senior scientist uh, at the National Institute for Disaster uh, risk monitoring and early warning uh, in Brazil, SEMADEN is the acronym, but he's long been uh, part of the, uh, the sort of scientific uh, and climate science organisations uh, in Brazil for many years. So you've been a long-standing uh, lead author on the uh, IPCC uh, and a lot of the collaborations between Brazil and the UK on climate science uh, have centred around Jose and his team. So. Uh, he's here this week uh, visiting the Met Office and the University of Exeter uh, as part of the Climate Science for Service Partnership uh, uh, Brazil, <coughs> which is a Met Office-led program, which has been a, uh, a one of the one of the founder members on the Brazil side, actually. So it's great you're here this week. Uh, so uh, yeah, just going to tell us about uh, our meteorological. Uh, oh, is this the is this the one I was expecting? I thought it was going to be about disasters. <laughs> uh, Sorry, this anyway. Uh, how do you make sure you enjoy season length in Amazonia uh, in the 2003 uh, drought? So over to you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Richard, for the introduction. Um, thank you, Andy, again for inviting me to become to be here at the UK Met Office and now uh, University of Exeter. What I'm going to show is the result of some of the work we have been doing really regarding the Amazon drought in last year. I think everyone saw the news, what happened, what's going on in the Amazon at the same time, came to the Nino, at the same time came to 2023, was the warmest year in record. So, uh, well, just starting with this. This is 2020, according to Copernicus, it's 2023 is the highest in record, and you just can expect the extremes in there, the Arctic. Arctic and Antarctic also actually uh, reducing. And in the case of Brazil, particularly in September, October, November, or December, uh, we have an episode of heat waves in there. So the first half of 2023 was under La Nina impacts. And then the second half, starting in May, we have impacts under El Nino, El Nino quite strong, which is, was unusual because it in May, Maximum intensity usually is at this time of the year during Austral summer. But in this case, it seems like it was more on the uh, springtime season, the very rainy season. And the city of Alas, Alas, well, I'm not Brazilian, so sometimes I cannot represent Alas registered 45.8 degrees centigrade in the state of Minas Gerais. That's what is considered the highest mm -hmm. in Mexican history. But the Brazilian history in terms of meteorological data is quite recent, it's from the 60s. So it's, it's a possibility that we may have other previous records. But the previous one was in Teresina in Piauí with 44.8. Um, this, this is just to keep, let's say, the background, the general background. And again, for the state of climate from the American Meteorological Society, these are the temperature anomalies, the mean temperature anomalies in Central South America, which is Peru, Brazil, Bolivia, and Paraguay. And if you notice 2023, compared to 2021 and 2022, 2021 and 22 were La Nina years, so we were expecting some sort of lower temperatures, but it really, you see the jump to 2023, and particularly because of the heat waves or during the second half, but this really was the warmest in at least from the 60s. Okay. Well, many of the some of these are in Portuguese, but there is one which is in, in, in English. And what happened in the Amazon? At, this, at the Amazon, in this particular time during the pre rainy season of 2023, meaning the austral winter of 2023. Winter is the dry season, but like I said, dry is, doesn't mean zero rainfall. It means less than 100, but it's still rain. Okay? And during springtime, October is the beginning of the rainy season in the Amazon. And that's when the major drought concentrated, drought and heat waves together. The bottom, bottom for the rosa is this, this, this mammal. It's like a pink dolphin. We call it Amazon dolphin, but the Brazilian name is bottom for the rosa. 
And if we see, for instance, in 2005, plenty of fish dead because of what? The drought combined with heat waves, the rios become, rivers become very shallow, and then you see the world water, uh, the water street gets very warm, lack of oxygen, hypoxia, and then fish die. But this is the first time in history, I will say history, because we have been talking with the different institutes working with biodiversity. This is the first time that the bottles or the dolphins die because of the hot weather. The waters reach almost 40 degrees, and these guys went there, basically, where the river is shallow, they sort of lost control over their minds because of the hypothermia, and they couldn't swim to deeper waters, and they die almost, by now it's almost 250. And this is important because this is sort of the symbol of the Amazon, okay? And also is one species uh, threatened by, by extinction. So this is perhaps one of the most important aspects of, of what could be the impacts of, of warmer and drier compound events under a situation uh, like El Niño, for instance. So, just to give you a quick uh, fact, not like introduction, natural climate variability, deforestation is moving towards a tipping point. You know, tipping point is a word that we use a lot. And sometimes people get really very interested, sometimes people get really very scared, because sometimes the word tipping point basically is the end of the world or catastrophe. But uh, uh, importantly, it's supposed to be a limit under which the climate on the current state could resist and then move to another type of climate. This is the warming trends, the lengthening of the dry season, and the decline of the carbon sink, particularly in the eastern part of the Amazon. The severe drought is affecting the western part of the Amazon in 2023. It is starting in the western part of the Amazon and then extending to several other parts of the Amazon. It was a very severe dry period in July 2023. Like I said, to July is the dry season. Again, dry doesn't mean zero. It rains, but this rains less than was expected, together with a warmer dry season and a dry air. And uh, still going, ongoing, and the spring in, in the very rainy season, uh, the announced spring. The special temporal evolution of the drought shows an increase in the extent of severity and is related at this time to El Niño 23, 24, mm -hmm. and to warm tropical Atlantic. Uh, and according to data from MAP Biomas, the Hectares, the coverage of water has reduced almost 2.7 billion of he hectares. The drought is affecting navigation. It's not just uh, lack of rainfall, because when we have, for instance, the lack of rainfall is the meteorological phenomena. But when you talk about impacts, the drought is the impacts, because the meteorological phenomena plus <laughs> increasing temperature and reducing atmospheric moisture, you have the drought. And as a consequence of that, the rivers go down. And as you can imagine, the Amazon, we don't have highways, we have basically waterways. Uh, so whenever we have a, a river with low river discharge or low flow, uh, people living on the banks of the river are really isolated. And seasonal forecast at the time, this is from a paper we have submitted to environmental research later. So if any of you guys a reviewer, don't be so hard with us. But uh, according to the characteristics of El Niño, the forecast for the March, April, May, March, April, May is the peak of the rainy season in Central Amazon. The forecast for that are of dry conditions. But that was assuming in December that El Niño may increase. And so far, the El Niño is has sort of stabilized in there. We see the Atlantic more active than the Pacific, but the Niño, I wouldn't say the Niño is going down. It's sort of stabilized. We don't know if it will continue like that or we'll just gain energy again later on. These are the sea surface temperature anomalies from two El Niños, uh, 2015, August, September, and October. The El Niño was 2015 and 16 because it extended on the Austral summer of 16. Remember, this is Southern Hemisphere, Austral summer. December, January, February. And this is August 23, September 23, October 23. So what are the similarities and differences? Well, the similarities are El Niño 
signal here, but the differences are on the Atlantic. The Atlantic really got very warm. The entire Atlantic, the tropical Atlantic, and the North Atlantic, way warm together with that. And it's amazing because usually during El Nino, we have less hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, meaning warm, relatively cold waters in the Gulf of Mexico. But we see here relatively warm waters. But the warmest waters were in the Atlantic itself. So there were less hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, and the hurricanes were more concentrated in the Atlantic, the open Atlantic. Some of them moving towards New York or uh, uh, Canada or Europe. You see, so the similarities and the differences are there. So it means that each El Nino is different, and this El Nino seems to be different than the previous ones. Oh, sorry. Yeah. These are rainfall anomalies from September 22 to October 23. As you can see, the blue colors are the positive rainfall anomalies and the red colors the negative rainfall anomalies. So what we see in 2023, we also sort of detected in 2022. In 2022, you see the negative rainfall anomalies in the western part of the Amazon in September. October, not that much. November, uh, the northern part of the Amazon in December, then January. February, and then the most important was basically starting in June 2022. July, August, September, and October. So, like I said, October is the beginning of the rainy season. But in this case, you see most of the red colors concentrated in October. So, whatever happens in 2023 was in fact showing the influence of what happened in 2022. 2022 was not an El Niño, it was La Niña year. So some of the possibilities of the causes of this drought are perhaps the transition between the El La Niña type and to El Niño in the middle, uh, in 2022. So that's, that's one, one possibility. And then, just to give you a quick dynamic meteorology case, when we have the warm surface waters here in the Pacific, we have convection, and then we have subsidence. And this subsidence, the convection is in here, the water cell, the subsidence comes over the Amazon region. And then we have over the Amazon region subsidence, meaning basically less rainfall, okay? And the cold fronts coming from the south, we have a, a, a positive uh, anticyclonic anomaly, basically a blocking, and the cold fronts remain stationary in the south. That's the reason why we have more rainfall in the south of Brazil, and less rainfall in the northern part of the Amazon. And if we use the same argue, argument here for the Gukhari cell, convection in the tropical Atlantic and then subsidence over the Amazon. This is basically a, a quick example of how the meteorology works. Uh, the upper part, I, I'm not going to explain that much, but this is the one which is, is important. And what happened in 2023? In 2023, we have the warm Pacific, the warm Indian Ocean, the warm North Pacific and the warm basically the, the entire Atlantic, tropical Atlantic and subtropical. Okay. And these are SPI from different data sets, from ERA, from CHIRPS, GPCC. And you see a pass and downs. You can see the history in 1998, for instance, what happened in 2015 and 16. And this is 2020. All these SPI here is negative. And this line represents the El Niño 3.4 temperature, so basically the opposite characteristic. So regardless of the data set you use, the signal is the same. And it's quite strong, so the signal is the same, but the magnitude perhaps is a bit different depending on the nature of each data set. Okay? And this is an SP, SPEI, Standardized Precipitation Evaporation Index. <laughs> it's an indicator of drought. El Niño 1982-83, El Niño 1997-98, El Niño 2009-9876, El Niño 15 and 16, and here 2020. So there is a big indicator that 2023 
was even worse. But the others actually were really quite bad. But 2020, so far, at least until December, it was the worst situation of drought in the Amazon. And this is a history of drought events detected uh, based on a literature review, historical documentation, and also the rivers, river levels in Manaus. If you see, for instance, in, 20, in 1906, we have a drought, which was related to El Niño, could be central El Niño, meaning that the warming is in the Central Pacific, or Eastern El Niño, where the warming is in the Eastern Pacific in 2012, and sorry, 1912, 1916, 25, 16, 25, 26, 1926, which actually we don't know if it was El Niño, El Niño, 48, 58, 63, 64, which was not El Niño, but was warm, tropical North Atlantic, 79, 82, 83, El Niño, 95, El Niño, Tropical North Atlantic, 97, El Niño, Tropical North Atlantic, 2005, Warm, Tropical North Atlantic, in the absence of El Niño, 2010, El Niño, and Tropical Atlantic, 2015, 16, El Niño, and Tropical Atlantic, and 2023, 2024, El Niño, and Tropical Atlantic. So, not all El Niño produces droughts, and not all droughts are related to El Niño. Each drought is different because uh, uh, depending, I mean, these are only, let's say, uh, indicators of drought. But if you see the individual maps, you may find that the drought is concentrated in one part of the Amazon. In other years, for instance, in 2005, it was concentrated in the southwestern part of the Amazon. But during El Niño 83 and 98 and 25, 16, 16, it was concentrated in the entire Amazon. Okay, so one thing is to say this was a drought year and it was a drought year, but there are differences among drought years. And this is for 2023, soil moisture. Uh, again, soil moisture until mid-October 2023, you have the negative soil moisture trend are normal in the central Amazon and the southern part of the Amazon. And this is from April, May, June, July, August, September. Again, the similar situation, particularly in the second half including part of North Amazon and southeastern part of the Amazon. And this is the temperature from era five. Uh, we divide the Amazon in four, re in four regions, but we consider only two regions here, the southern Amazon, June, July, August, September, October, November. Our uh, spring, we consider spring because in 2023 uh, was the warmest. If you notice, for instance, the dots, the dots represent uh, warm years, which are El Niño. Again, in uh, July, August, in Eastern Amazon and Southern, and Eastern Amazon in both cases, July, August, September, October, November. So the tendency is higher in the Southern part of the Amazon. And again, the warmest years were the ones related to, to El Niño. And the warmest ones in 1980 was 2023, particularly in September, October, November. These are temperature anomalies from June, July, August through March, April, May. For El Niño, 82, 83, 97, 98, 2005, 2010, 2015, and I have June, July, August, September, October, November, and 23, 23, 24, I didn't include yet, it's 23. And you notice the differences, just looking for the evolution of colors. You see, for instance, 97, 98, remember that for a while, 98 was the warmest year in history, but was before 2015, 2016. Then we come 2015, 6, 2016, the red color dominates, and in the same situation for 2023 uh, over there. So basically, it means that 2023 was the warmest on the record, okay, at least during the pre rainy season. We have to update this analysis for the summer season, which is not over yet in, in, in South, South, South America. And these are the heat waves. For the work we did with Andrea Doretti from the Joint Research Center, we published a report on the drought in Amazon in 2023. And these are uh, for uh, July, August, and October heat waves. You see, for instance, the number of heat days of the heat wave, three to four, and then in here in the Amazon, 
14 days. And the heat waves were concentrated, were along the year, but they were concentrated mostly uh, started in August. August, September, October, November, they have six heat waves. December has one heat wave, and other three were uh, sparse between January and July. There was, the August was, was unusual because August is a winter time. So it was a heat wave during a winter time. It actually was very warm, okay? So the, like I said, the combination of both, the heat wave in here, the lack of rainfall in the other. So it was a, a perfect confound event. And this is the uh, NDVI from April, May, June, July, August, September, the 21 of each month in 2023. And if you notice, starting from June, all this region, July, August, concentrated in here, is the part of the Amazon, and then in the eastern part of the Amazon also, the negative NDVI. Or the NDVI indicating vegetation under, under stress. And this is the surface water pressure. What does it mean? The negative values, the increased values means drier atmosphere. And we have December 80, December, January, February 83, December, January, February 98, two El Niños, more concentrated in the northern part. December, January, February 2016. You notice that? Since we don't have December, uh, January, and February 2023, we just put September, October. November. And you see again the red columns. And it isn't the whole Amazon, the dryness, the dry characteristics of air in this. So we see warmer temperatures, lack of rainfall, a higher deficit of water vapor pressure. And this is an index, integrated drought index for the Amazon region, starting in September, October, November, 2022, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. You see, for instance, in June, July, August, the western part of the Amazon, the dry season became even drier, and the eastern part of the Amazon, the dry season became even drier and warmer. And also in here, the western part of the Amazon, the southern part of the Amazon, basically all this region where are the characteristics of extreme drought and exceptional drought. Okay, this is just to give you an interaction of all of those elements that I showed before. And this is another way to see. It. This is the drought index from the University of Nebraska, the US drought monitor. Same region, same characteristics. You see, it's basically almost the same. The same regions affected under dry conditions. In, in this case, it's in, uh, from June to November. And currently, when I say currently, I said until 15 of May, or uh, January, sorry, 15 of January. The reason, the region in the Amazon, these are observations, it's still showing now, I mean, according to the locals, the rainy season has started two months late, but has started. But it's not, yeah, even though it's raining in some particular places, it's not enough to get the volumes of the river at the same level as normal. So the rivers are glowing, but not as high as they are supposed to be, according to Granatology. Yeah, this is the rainfall from December, November, 23, December 23, and January 24. Again, all this region in the southern part of the Amazon and the eastern part of the Amazon, the western part of the Amazon, sorry, showing negative rainfall anomalies. And in the south, the positive rainfall anomalies, which are signals of, of El Niño. And by December 2023, the integrated drought index, the same index I showed before, this is for the three months. Three months is an indicator of agricultural drought, and six months is an indicator of hydrological drought. This is for December 23, and you see actually the parts of the Amazon, the central part of the Amazon with the moderate levels of drought, and in here, extreme levels of drought. The state of Acre, Rondonia, Amazonas, Mato Grosso, 
Uh, Mato Grosso do Sul also with the Pantanal region over there. But you see this part, all this part of the Amazon, uh, the latitude of Acre down, showing negative rainfall anomaly, showing uh, drought characteristics. And this is uh, a situation, for instance, in here we have uh, what is supposed to be the precipitation of three millimeters in pentas, which is basically the threshold. We use the threshold of 100 millimeters per month, less than 100 millimeters per month, or 3.3 millimeters per day, is an indicator of a dry month. Okay, so this is an indicator for beyond above dry month, and this is what is supposed to be climatology. This is what what's happened in uh, fall of December. You see, there are rainfall in some places, in other places not, meaning that the rainy season has not started yet. And this is for 24th of January. Again, it has improved the situation, but there are still places where there, is, there has no, no rainfall, meaning that the situation has been improving, but not reaching the levels to satisfy the demands left because of the drought in there. Okay. And uh, in here, you see the river levels, the impacts of the river levels. Uh, in the uh, broken black line is the mean, and 2023 is the light blue. You could see, for instance, in some places like in Rio Negro in Manaus. This is the mean, okay? So the first half, the blue line and the mean were almost at the same place, because that was the La Nina situation. But later on, look what happened with the light blue. The light blue went down until here, even lower than the minimum levels measured. So all of this was the situation in October, when we had the lowest levels of the Rio Negro in and similar situations in others. You see, for instance, in Itacoatiara, this is the mean, this is 2023, in other places, like Madeira and Maita, this is mean, this is 2023, and similar places. So these are from different rivers in the Amazon. These are observations. Okay. And from the Sentinel, we get this, this picture showing what? For that particular box, the Rio Urucu is this one. And uh, and this is in September 2022. And this is the same place in September 2023. So what happened? Look at this in blue, in brown, and in some places in here actually too. So they basically what happened? The rivers were very, very shallow or basically disappeared. You see, that's a, that's a clear image of what happened with the drought situation in there. And in here, you see, there are two figures in here, which perhaps I shouldn't put it separately, but this is the flood of 2021 in Manaus. If you notice, there is a wall with the, with the levels. It's the water is in here. It's the highest level measured. This is in the drought 2023. The wall is in here. The river actually basically disappear. Yeah. Okay, that's the best figure that we see in Manaus. The Rio Negro reaches the lowest levels in 120 years in Manaus. And those are the maximum river levels and the minimum river levels. And the minimum river levels in here, 2023, it was like 12.6 meters in October 26. Uh, but there is something else in here. You'll notice, since the rainfall data, we don't have enough long time series, we rely on river data. And the river data in Manaus started in 1903, so it's more than 20, 120 years. You see, according to that, there is a significant increase in the steam floods, but there is not a significant increase in droughts. If you see, for instance, each one of these numbers represent a drought, and each one of those numbers up there represents uh, flaws. I mean, this green bar covers some of the numbers, but you see more blue numbers than red numbers. 
that's what it explains that there is a tendency, it seems to be a tendency more than for more floods than droughts. But we may have low, uh, I would say, uh, less flood, less droughts, but they are quite intense. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, this is for September, October. I have, I haven't seen, and what I, I know now that the rivers, uh, the levels of the river in Manaus, they are improving, but it doesn't reach the the values that were they are expected. Oops, sorry. Oh. Well, uh, okay. This is a Hofmuller diagram that shows from 1951 to 2020 23 a profile of the rainfall from Eastern Amazon to Southern Amazon. It goes from January to December. The blue, dark blue colors represent the rainy season. The white colors in here, or light blue, very light blue, represents the uh, dry season. Each black line represents 100 millimeters. You see, 100 millimeters is our boundary, I would say, between dry season and wet season. What happened? In the southern Amazon, you notice that uh, after the climate shift in the 70s, the droughts usually meaning that the extent the dry season gets longer and longer and longer. If you notice the average is in red lines, but you see the yellow line. The yellow line means that the dry season is becoming longer in the southern part of the Amazon. And during El Niño, the drought season is longer. And in Eastern Amazon, there is no such a tendency, or well, at least statistically significant, there is no such a tendency. But we notice a strong interannual variability. Whenever we have drought, the dry season, gets longer, it started earlier and ended late. And a late dry season, a late end of the dry season means a late onset of the rainy season. But this is one form to see this. And the other is this. This is the wet season onset, and this is the dry season blend. For southern, for eastern Amazon, and Southern Amazon. For Eastern Amazon, uh, there is no significant level. There is an increase on the, uh, these are pentas. There is increase of the pentas with the onset of the rainy season, meaning starting late, and there is an increase in the duration of the dry season. For, for them, uh, however, it's not statistically significant. But in the Southern part of the Amazon, it is statistically significant. The dry season is getting longer, and the dry the wet season is starting late. Okay, this is uh, in agreement with what the Hofmuller diagram shows. Uh, all of these are observations, not more. Okay, so what happened? Why the dry season gets uh, strong and powerful and longer? That means that onset of the dry season reds really late. So what, for what reason there is a late onset of the dry season? This is because during a spring time, this is latent heat, okay? Negative anomalies of latent heat. So basically dry conditions in here. According to MODIS evapotranspiration, a low percentage of evapotranspiration in this region. And according to the terrestrial water system from water storage from grace, in those two, we have less water in the surface. So what happened? Soil is dry, higher temperatures, no latent heat, or very, very small latent heat, meaning no water vapor, and the dry air, the evapor evapotranspiration reduces. And with evaporation, evapotranspiration reduces, there is not enough water to produce clouds for the beginning of the rain, of the dry, uh, of the wet season. Okay, so those three, with those three, we explain that. That could happen. Other way to see it, the rainfall. The average is in blue, 
declaratory in 2023 and the third particular day is there. Did you notice in both cases, it's well below clamatology. Well below clamatology, particularly here. See, this is what's supposed to be and this is what happened. So at the end, when we start closing the paper, uh, the rainy season hasn't started yet by December. It's supposed to start in October. So by the end of December, it hasn't started yet. But January, it starts to rain again. It seems like the rainy season managed to start, but almost two months, two months and a half late. So we will have to see the consequences later on this year, because whenever we have a longer dry season and a late onset, there are two aspects that change. The risk of fire gets higher, and the possibility of drought in the rivers get higher also. Why? Because of the peak of the rainy season in Manaus. Manaus is in the central Amazon. The peak of the rivers in Manaus is March, April, May. But Manaus reflects the water coming from the north and from the south. From the south is the Solimo River and the Madeira River. And some of them, they have a region of southern Amazon where it didn't rain enough during the rainy season, okay? So we may be expecting very low levels in Manaus. We don't know if it will be low records in Manaus in March, April, May, which is supposed to be the peak. So we don't know if it will be the lowest in history, but we will expect that lower river levels because what is raining is not raining enough to produce that. So the lengthening of the dry, se of the dry season is significant in Southern Amazon. Uh, why it is not significant in Eastern Amazon, and both shows the influence of El Niño and Tropical North Atlantic. The current drought in the Amazon seems to be more like an extension of the dry season. You see, at the time we closed this paper was the extension of the dry season. The pre-rainy season was really very weak, and together with the pre-rainy season, to complicate things, together with the lack of rainfall, there were six. Uh, it is there, it's four, but in reality, there were six heat waves during the dry season and spring. The, to induce low river rivers during the low rainy season, drying some ponds and rivers with a strong impact in population and biodiversity. The, the Amazon dolphin, for instance, one of, one of the victims of these shallow rivers or very shallow lakes and ponds, with very warm water, almost about 39 degrees centigrade. For southern and eastern Amazon, the rainy season 23, 24, apparently has not started yet. Like I said, we submitted this paper in December. But by now it has started, but it has started perhaps in the middle of January, quite late. I mean, there is a concern of this situation and also the forecast of El Niño, if it amplifies El Niño, what may happen in the central Amazon. Because if we have a drought situation in central Amazon, we may have even higher risk of fires. We already have higher risk of fires in the Amazon. We may have even worse. And as I mentioned on Monday, I mean, I'm not going to discuss uh, the, the attribution of, of causes of this, but there was a report by the World Weather Attribution showing that climate change, not El Niño, are main drivers of the drought. I mean, this is quite complex, I, I, I know, but it's, it's interesting to read because that may say, for instance, if you notice, the warming in the Atlantic was the whole Atlantic. So there was a difference on the degree of warming in, in tropical oceans in general, and it was more warm, it's a warmer in 2023. So it is a possibility, we have to look at that clearly. But again, it's extremely important because when we talk about tipping points, for instance, if you just consider the September, October, November, 2023, we already in that particular period, we surpass all the threshold of tipping points. So that was an example of Amazon if the tipping point is surpassed forever. You see, that was one sample of what things could happen. And you notice, or you see that it wasn't a very beautiful, a very clear situation, okay? Well, with this, I finished my presentation. Uh, I hope uh, 
I manage your expectations, I met your expectations. And if you have any question, please let me know. Thank you. Yeah, so any questions? Steve, sure. you mentioned fire in the last, um, uh, well, just like before last. Uh, what's happened to fires um, over the last few months? I guess it's increased a lot. It has been increasing, yes, it has been increasing because of the usually when we have, uh, I mean, most of the fires in Brazil are related to human causes, not lightning. And what happened is like, uh, in 2010, also, there was a lot of fires because some of the material left from 2005 that didn't burn, burn in 2010. It's the same thing in 2015, 16. So I would say that this year probably we will have even more fires than 2015, 2016 because the conditions are, are there, basically. Anyone else? Yeah, Steve. Anyone online, put your hand up uh, or just shout out as well, but uh, Andy in the room. Yeah. I'm interested in the positive trend in the high river level in Manaus. Yeah. What What do you think the drivers are for that? Well, they, we have been looking for explanations and these changes, it has been more noticeable since the beginning of the, since, since the middle of the 70s. And uh, there are studies that shows that from the 80s, there was uh, what is called the intensification of the hydrological cycle, meaning that the moisture transport coming from the tropical North Atlantic has increased. So one explanation could be the increase of rainfall after the 80s in that particular region, the northern part of the, 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 uh, the basin. That could explain the maximums. But also, we have to look at the minimums. <laughs> and it doesn't fit that well. But yes, that's one of the plans. They, they observe the intensification of the hydrological cycle since the 80s. Yeah. Okay. You think it's because of the, maybe because of the, well, I, I, I know there was no positive trend in the, in the, in the, the drought periods, but, um, but if you have a generally increasing duration of, Drought periods. Does that mean that the hydrological cycle, the, the monsoon, heavy rainfall periods are, are condensed into so there's more moisture in the system to, to get out more quickly? Yeah, more quickly and perhaps a shorter monsoon season. Okay. Which actually comes well with the explanation of the longer dry seasons. Mm. You see, those, it's, it's, it's a possibility. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you think uh, you, some engineering interventions like storing, you know, kind of collecting um, flood water and using it in drought season would be would help the situation in Amazon? Or is, is something like this being kind of implemented? Well, in the Amazon, we had the hydropower dams that help in, in terms of um, uh, saving water for energy, because in Brazil, the hydroelectric system is connected. So if something happens in the Amazon, we have impacts in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. You see? Yeah. But the problem of building physical infrastructure in there is, is something really, very really questionable because of the, the environmental laws in Brazil, which actually are quite strong now. I mean, in the previous government, they, didn't get, they do whatever they want. And uh, the possibility exists, but again, what will be the advantage? I mean, in terms of environmental impacts, could be even worse. You see, so there is always, the, the dams are there already, but they are not building anymore. But they are usually just mass for water security. And right now, for instance, they are trying to, to, to come with a build that, to start exploring oil in near the mouth of the Amazon River because there are one plenty of foil in there. But again, this varies on the uh, environmental law because developing that, that will mean you will have new towns and cities, you will have highway, you will have pollution, and you will have a major impact on the Amazon itself. So this is one of the other th the other extremes, I mean, or B2 development or two environmental. There is always a, a difficult to, to say which is correct or to keep the balance in there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but there is a lot of pressure to start building things on the Amazon, a lot. I can see there's a, something in the chat. Is that there's a question, question online, yeah, yeah. So from Lucy Rowland. Um, how do the anomalies in the Amazon compare to other Brazilian biomes? <coughs> Excuse me. Northeast Brazil and the Cerrado have been very hot too. How do the drought impacts compare? Well, yes, the Brazilian Cerrado is... There are two parts when you have the Brazilian Cerrado. It's the western... The southern, southwestern Brazil, which is basically the boundary with the southern Amazon, the state of Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso del Sur. And that region, which is the southern part of the Amazon, has been uh, oh, one of the main regions for soybean production. And soybean is one of the major commodities. But the other region with uh, Cerrado, where has been also developed for soybean production, is the region what we call Mato Piva, which is the state of Marañón, Tocantins, Piauí, and Bahia. You have the Amazon, you have the Cerrado, and you have the Caatinga. Caatinga is the Northeast Brazil. So that particular region of Cerrado between the Amazon and the Caatinga is under high development of soybean. But the things we notice in the Eastern Amazon, like the longer dry season, warmer dry season, drier dry season, are also extended to this part of Mato Piva. So whatever we are seeing in Eastern Amazon, it seems to be extending its influence to the Cerrado. So it will be affecting Cerrado. It will be affecting the Brazilian economy because Cerrado, the Mato Piva region, is supposed to be the second agricultural frontier in Brazil. So it, it really affects not just the Amazon, but also the Cerrado too. So I have a question myself. So as I say, we've been working together for nearly 25 years and the, the Met Office Hadley Centre got interested in the Amazon in particular because our model in the late 90s had CM3 was projecting you know, severe droughts and Amazon dieback and tipping point and so on. Do you think we're now seeing that play out? Is the model turning out to be kind of right, do you think? Or is it too early to say what's your, what's your feeling on this? Well, from the work, the observational work, from Luciana Gatti, from Ipe, for instance, mm. she claims that in the eastern part of the Amazon, according to their observations, the flux towers in there, mm. the situation it seems to be like they already reached the tipping point because it's a source of carbon, longer dry seasons, warmer dry seasons, drier dry seasons, and rainfall reductions. What is supposed to be expected in a... In a, in a global warming scenario uh, uh, because of the dieback of the Amazon forest. It has been noticed in the eastern part, only in the eastern part. And the eastern part is the most deforested one, you see. But like I said, I mean, these are basically observational results. We have to see with models what could happen. Because at, at the time, I remember they had, I think they was, they had, CM3, right? Yes, that's what I mean. It was the first model showing the dieback, but later on it came under attack because it was the only model showing it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the things of the dieback is really starting on that particular year mm -hmm. when you publish your paper. Yeah. Uh, I think it was in the 80s. Late 90s. Late, yeah. late, 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 late 90s. So that's the reason why the tipping point is something still there. I mean, it's, it's in the atmosphere of conversations and it's a catastrophic scenario that's the reason why sometimes when we talk about climate change we are more catastrophic than optimists mm -hmm. optimists yes okay <laughs> uh, any other questions yes yeah, so, you're just saying about um uh, was it deforestation in the east of uh, Amazon, and uh, that that was a sort of area that was that was drying quite quite a bit. Um, have have there been sort of studies looking at, um, like um, a, a, a sort of signal from deforestation on a sort of a reduction of rainfall over the uh, Amazon? Uh, uh, I, I, I know that would be sort of difficult to to sort of get to sort of pick out from the other sort of factors in. In, in, in involved, but uh, uh, but um, yeah, but but I've uh, been sort of studies seeing if where sort of where there's been regions of deforestation that's led to less rainfall or 
prior conditions. There is a tendency. I mean, even so for the whole Amazon, we don't see a clear trend of upward downward. But when you divide the Amazon in two, the northern part of the Amazon they shows a rainfall increase because of this and um, intensification of the hydrological cycle from the 80s. It's significant. And the southern part of the Amazon seems to be a reduction of rainfall. It's not statistically significant, but it's, 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 it's where you see the most of the deforestation, what's called the deforestation arc. Mm -hmm. In the eastern part of the Amazon, the work by Gatti shows situations that resemble uh, what would be uh, a tipping point. And then in the southern part of the Amazon, where are the states of Mato Grosso, um, part of Rondonia and Acre, you see actually a, a, a tendency from the 80s to rainfall reduce, could actually, like I said, I'm not an expert on attribution, but could be also uh, related to changes in land use. Because we usually see the physical part, which is a Nino, Atlantic, or cold fronts coming from the south, the south Atlantic convergence. So, but there is a possibility, yes, that the, the deforestation in there may help in, in to reduce rainfall. But like I said, I mean, there, there, there is no, uh, so far I don't know, let's say, okay, 70% of the rainfall is reduced because of deforestation. Just an example. I mean, I, I don't know of those such studies. There should be perhaps in attribution things. But there is a signal, yes, there is a signal. Yeah, so it would be difficult to pick out from the other, other factors. Yes. But, uh, yeah, except for you get sort of less transpiration from the, if there's sort of less vegetation. And uh, and also, if there's less uh, com convection going on, that would that mean, yes, mean sort yes. of less air being drawn in mm -hmm. from sort of elsewhere. To, yeah, yeah, less convection, less latent heat in the atmosphere because of less vegetation. So it's, it's, it's I mean, it makes sense. Physically, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I might have to leave the room in a minute or two. So, I think there's two more points in the chat. There are questions then. Um, okay, go on. Okay. Uh, in that case, we should probably finish. The room may be occupied for control for almost. So, uh, well, thank you, Jose, again for a fascinating and sobering talk. Thank you. Thank you. There is some tea and coffee outside as well. Oh, well, I just want to help. Yes, thanks for reaching out. Um,